Distinguished future physicians, welcome to Stomp on Step 1, the only free video series that helps you study more efficiently by focusing on the highest yield material. With this video, we're going to be trying something a little different. I've already released 12 videos covering all of biostats and epidemiology. In those videos, I went through each topic in detail and then let you know how important each topic was for the USMLE Step 1 exam by posting a high yield rating in the top right corner of each slide. With this video, we're going to try something new and hopefully you all can give me some feedback on this and let me know if this is worthwhile. But with this video, I'm not actually gonna cover any real material. This is just gonna be some overarching strategies and suggestions for these type of questions, as well as a more in-depth list of the high yield ratings for this chapter ranked from highest yield to lowest yield. So basically collecting the high yield ratings from all the videos, making a list, and then also throwing in some new content you haven't seen about how to do better on these types of questions. First, I'm gonna quick review what the high yield rating is for those of you that aren't familiar with it. The thought behind it is that it's impossible to perfectly relearn two years worth of medical school curriculum in just a few weeks leading up to your medical board exam. This often leads to frustration and anxiety when students are preparing for the step one exam. What I wish somebody would have explained to me before I took my exam is that a relatively small amount of material makes up a huge majority of the questions. And unfortunately, a lot of the study aids out there don't focus enough on these high yield material. Of course, textbooks and lectures are probably the worst efficient study materials. As you get down into some of the more popular books for step one, they do a little bit better job, but they still have a lot of room for improvement here. So what we'd really like to do is narrow in on the most efficient way to study. So you might be asking yourself, how do I know which topics are most important? This is where the high yield rating comes in. It's what sets stomp on step one apart from the other study aids. The high yield rating allows you to focus on the most important information for the exam and not get bogged down in all the minutia. This allows you to reduce your level of stress and study more efficiently. You've heard a lot about evidence-based medicine in school. This is sort of evidence-based studying. The high yield rating is a scale from zero to 10 that gives you a rough estimate for how important each topic is for the USMLE step one medical board exam. Focusing your efforts on the higher yield topics will yield you more correct answers for a given amount of study time. A high yield rating of one means there's roughly a 10% chance of seeing that question on step one. A rating of five would roughly correlate to a 50-50 chance of seeing that topic on the exam. And a high yield rating of 10 means you're almost definitely gonna see at least one question, probably even more than one question on that topic. So you might be wondering how the high yield rating is calculated. It's a pseudo scientific calculation that takes into account my experience with the exam, my classmates and friends experiences, as well as the USMLE content outline. But the biggest factor in determining the high yield rating is how often each topic appears in practice exams that are available commercially. This includes the MBME comprehensive basic science self assessments, which are retired step one questions as well as some various other commercially available question banks that you've probably heard of. I have painstakingly gone through thousands and thousands of these questions and counted by hand how often each topic shows up. I weigh questions from certain sources a bit more than others and then do some overly complicated math to convert that number into a percentage chance of seeing that topic on the exam. So now we'll start talking about biostats here. I'm gonna start with some big picture items and give you a few strategies for this section before I go into the high yield ratings. You may have be having an instant reaction to biostats, the fact that you hate it, and a lot of people do seem to hate this section more than the others. I think the biggest reason students don't like these questions is because they feel like it isn't real medicine. It isn't related to diagnosis or treatment, so people aren't really sure how useful it is. And although these questions are very different than the rest of the exam, it doesn't mean it isn't useful to medicine. No matter what field you go into, you're going to have to be able to read the primary literature for yourself and be able to make up your own mind about complicated topics. 
And if you don't understand the topics in this section and how biostatics and epidemiology works, you won't be able to critically appraise the literature for yourself. Another reason some med students seem to hate this material is that many med school curriculums don't focus enough time on it, so students don't feel comfortable. But don't worry about that, we'll fix that with this video series, and by the end of these videos I guarantee you will see this section as the easiest questions on the whole exam. They're basically freebies. A huge majority of the questions in this section ask you to regurgitate a simple definition or do some very basic calculations that most middle schoolers could do if you just gave them the correct formulas. Now compare that to an organ systems question where you may be required to tie in knowledge from anatomy, physiology, pathology, and pharmacology to work through a complicated differential diagnosis to get an answer. These questions are a lot easier and the amount of material you need to know for this section is a lot smaller than, you know, for example, renal or something like that. One of the other things I can do with the high yield rating is estimate how many questions you're going to get for each section. And based on my calculations, two to three percent of the questions on the step one exam will be about biostats and epidemiology because there's 322 questions on the exam that comes out to somewhere between six and ten questions on your exam that you're going to get. For a lot of biostats or epi questions, you don't actually have to read the whole question stem. They often start with a long paragraph about the study's design or whatever disease is being studied. However, most of the time they are asking you to regurgitate a definition of a term, which does not change based on the particular question stem, or they're asking you to do some basic calculations, which really just means you're plugging in the numbers they give you into a formula. So again, the text doesn't really matter there. Even if the question stem is describing a disease you've never heard of, don't get thrown off by that. A lot of the biostats questions could literally be in another language and you still would be able to answer them because you're just picking out the numbers and plugging them into the correct formula. If you're able to notice quickly that the question you're looking at is from biostats, you may even want to skip over most of the question stem and just read the last sentence or two. If you're going to save a few seconds by skipping over portions of the question stem, I suggest you also spend that extra time on double checking your work and avoiding dumb math errors. This is a very long test. Your brain's probably going to be fried by the end of it. So it's much more likely you're going to make a really dumb error. A nice thing about these questions is that you do have some room for error. Usually the answers are pretty far apart so that a small rounding error or something like that is not going to give you the wrong answer. You won't usually see answers that are like 43.5%, 43.6%, 43.9%, something like that. They're usually going to be a good chunk different. You'll see something like 5%, 23%, 43%. 95%. So even if you're just in the ballpark of the right answer, you can usually rule out a couple of the answer choices. Keep an eye out for the different formats some of the answers are in. Sometimes they'll give you the final answer. Sometimes the answers listed will be something like 79%. But other times they'll give you something that's basically a step backwards from the final answer, or a step before the final answer. So instead of 79%, you might get 110 over 140. I think what they're trying to do with that is save you a step so you don't have to do the math, but it can also confuse some people because if you went about the problem a little bit differently, you might not have ever had that step. So just keep an eye out for that. Now we'll start with the uh, high yield ratings for the different specific topics. This list is going to go from highest yield to lowest yield. You definitely need to learn your 2x2 two two tables as well as the things that make up the 2x2 two two table, true positive, true negative, false positive, false negative, etc. You need to be able to set up a 2x2 two two table, know how to interpret it, how to use it to solve calculations, as well as the definitions of the things that go into a 2x2 two two table. And you'll probably have a couple of questions on your exam that have a 2x2 two two table. And sometimes they'll give you the actual table and other times they'll just give you all of the information you need and you have to build it yourself based on the text. Next thing, which I had give a high yield rating of nine, is bias and study design. This is a broad topic that includes a lot of different things that cause bias, what measures you take to diminish bias, and how to identify studies with clear bias. This section is made up of a few lower yield things all sort of grouped together and the most important of those would be randomization, 
sampling and selection bias and blinding and placebo. But again, there are a lot of other lower yield things which you could group into this bias section. The next thing with a high yield rating of nine is the sensitivity and specificity. You need to know how to calculate those things given numbers. You need to know how to interpret the findings in words, what it means. You know the key differences between the two because there are some similarities between sensitivity and specificity. You need to know when to use which one in which situation and the effect prevalence can have on these measures. Then we've got the types of study design and this is mainly going to include knowing how to identify what study design you are given a description of a study. There are a lot of different study designs, but the three main ones you need to focus on are going to be cohort, case control, and clinical trials, randomized control trials. Next with a high yield rating of eight is going to be incidence and prevalence. You need to know the definitions of these terms, how to calculate them, how to interpret numbers that are given to you, differences between the two because there are some similarities and some overlap, uh, the relation between these two terms and duration, and when to use these measures. Now we'll move on to some of the more uh, mid-range high yield ratings. We've got p-value here with a rating of six. You need to know what p-value is, what it means, how to interpret it, how it relates to type one error and statistical significance, uh, the relationship between alpha and how you know when to reject the null hypothesis. You do not need to know how to manually calculate p-value or how even some computer would calculate p-value. The next one is going to be positive predictive value and negative predictive value. You need to know how to calculate these terms, how to interpret what you find in words, uh, the difference between the two, when to use each, the effect prevalence can have on these measures. Next with also a high yield rating of six is going to be relative risk and odds ratio. You need to know how to calculate and interpret these like I keep saying over and over. Uh, you need to know what the line of no difference is and how to use that and then when you use relative risk compared to an odds ratio. Confidence intervals has a high yield rating of four. I don't know how it relates to things like p-value, relative risk, odd ratio, the different types of confidence intervals, the most common being 90%, 99%, 95%, how to use the line of no difference to determine statistical significance, and how to interpret a confidence interval you're given. The next grouping in this mid-range high yield rating is going to be the measures of central tendency. So more specifically, you need to know how to calculate mean, median, and mode, as well as what their definitions are. You're gonna know, need to know how these three measures change as a result of changes to the data set, which is gonna be how robust these measures are, as well as how these measures of central tendency can graphically appear on something like a histogram with different types of skew. So those are the three sort of subsets of the larger group of the measures of central tendency. Next we have uh, standard deviation, which also has a high yield rating of four. You need to understand it conceptually as well as graphically. You need to know how changes in sample size can affect standard deviation, but you do not need to know how to calculate it. Now we're getting into some of the lower yield stuff that's still worth knowing, um, but not focusing as much attention on statistical testing. For this, you have to know just the very basics of when to use the different tests. You don't really no need to know how they work or how to do them. The number needed to treat or alternatively the number needed to harm. You need to know the basic definition and how to calculate them. Case fatality rate, again, very basic, just the one or two sentence definition and how you plug numbers into a formula to calculate it. There's power, you need to know how to calculate it, interpret it, what its definition is, how it relates to beta and type two error, how it changes with changes in sample size and effect size. Absolute risk reduction and attributable risk, you know how to calculate those and what those mean. Now we're moving into what I call no yield. 
these are the topics that are so low yield, I would suggest not focusing much attention on them. I'm not saying you should completely ignore these topics. What I am saying is you shouldn't study much of these topics until you've learned all of the higher yield material really well. And some of these topics are certainly very important for your rotations or just medicine in general. So I would suggest learning these things if you know, you're know you in MS1 or you're in the beginning of MS2 year, but if you've only got a few weeks left before your exam, don't really spend much time on these topics. These first three things listed are actually specifically listed on the current USMLE content outline. And they were not listed on the content outline from, say, five years ago. So while my calculations tell you they're very low yield, it is possible they've recently decided to start focusing more on these topics. However, I think it's more likely that the content outline and the actual test don't line up perfectly because I really haven't seen many of these types of questions, so I'm still going to put them under the no yield rating. This is going to be Kaplan-Meier survival curves, ROC curves, correlation coefficient, and regression. Here's some more things that are rated as no yield. Uh, persistent and accuracy, if I was feeling a little bit more generous, maybe I'd give it a high yield rating of 1, but I still wouldn't focus much attention on it. Uh, different levels of prevention, primary, secondary, tertiary, uh, the different phases of clinical trials, range, interquartile range, uh, Z-scores, pre-test, post-test probability, intention to treat versus per protocol, uh, blocking, which is a type of randomization, kind of like stratification, uh, allocation concealment, Hawthorne effect, observer ex expectancy bias, a uh, few more things, uh, funnel plots, publication bias, forest plot, uh, subgroup analysis, lead time and length time bias, uh, different types of outcomes, how you would classify those, surrogate, clinical, composite, and hazard ratios. Those are all the things I'm rating as a high yield rating of zero or no yield. That brings us to the end of this video. If you haven't done so already, I would suggest checking out the 12 video series I have covering all of biostats and epidemiology. To see a list of videos in that playlist, you can click this green button here. Alternatively, if you would just like to jump to the first video in the series and watch them all in order, you can click this black box here to see the first video in the series that covers standard deviation, mean, median, and mode. Thank you so much for watching and good luck with the rest of your studying.